Welcome back to the Dallas Prospect. I'm DDP, and today we're going to be talking about the Mavericks' latest signing, one that I am particularly excited about here. I'm, of course, talking about Derek Jones Jr. Yesterday, Shams breaks news that the Mavericks have signed him to a one-year deal that is fully guaranteed. There's a reason I'm excited about this. If you look at the numbers, you might think, like, well, why are you so amped about this? He's a small forward, power forward, but he can play small ball center. In fact, 10% of his minutes last year for Chicago were at the center position. So he's a versatile defender. His metrics aren't going to jump out at you necessarily. He's 6'5", 210. He's a seven-year veteran, so still age, I think, 26 at this point. And his career best year was 2019-2020 with Miami, in which he had eight and a half points, one steal, a little over half a block a game on 52.7% from the field and 3.9 boards in 23.3 minutes per game. Nothing phenomenal, a nice player for sure, but his career averages are 6.3 points, 3.2 boards, shoots about 50.8% from the field. And if you're looking at his three point percentage, that's just a tick over 30. It's like 30.4%. And we're talking about a guy who's played in close to 350 games for his career, including 22 playoff games. So while he was part of Miami's 2020 finals run in the bubble, he's a guy who is a nice role player, athletic, uh, versatile defender. But a lot of what he does isn't going to scream at you in the box score. And that's why it can be a little bit of a deceiving thing here. But he was a quality rotation piece for the Bulls. Um, who helps lead them to the playoffs for the first time since 2017. I already mentioned the Miami run that he had. And so if you look at last year in particular, he played in 64 games, which is a little on the low end for what you would ideally want. But again, we're talking about a rotation player on a one-year deal, so that's not so bad. 64 games last year for the Bulls. He averaged five points, 2.4 boards, and shot 50% from the field, including 33.8% from three. So a little bit of a tick up there. If you actually look at his three point shooting in his career, his last two seasons are slowly ticking in the right direction, even if that direction is just average. But here's the thing that production, while minimal, was 14 minutes per game. If he was still playing like Miami 2019, 2020 minutes, like 23 minutes a game essentially, I would be more concerned about it, thinking that it's not. As significant, but it does seem like when he's on the floor, he is making an impact, uh, even in the box score. But his value really goes beyond that. This is his fourth team. He played, obviously, I mentioned Chicago and Miami, but he also had stints in Portland and Phoenix as well. And for a guy that was undrafted in the 2016 draft, that's a pretty good showing. That's a pretty good thing. For the Bulls, he was their best rim runner and a versatile big or not, I say big, a versatile player who could play even a small ball center role. What's more is his impact for Chicago is pretty significant. When he was on the floor last year, Chicago was plus seven and a half points per 100 possessions better. That is pretty sizable impact there. So when you're looking at someone that's going to be essentially slotted behind Grant Williams in your rotation, that's a really nice player to come on off the bench again his rim running ability great three-point percentage pretty average but he'll at least get good looks presumably in dallas versatile defender it's just another move that so well fits the mold of what dallas has done this offseason i actually i know it's easy to say this because it's like well yeah look at the number of moves that have gone your way i actually am fully in now on the idea of Nico Harrison, not just in like, oh, he's a relationships manager. Yeah, that might've been enough to bring in Kyrie, you know, to a, a longer term deal, a three-year deal. But really it's more than that. Like his impact and vision for this team, he took a team and completely remade it in one off season where they went from this incredibly precarious position where they had to tank the last two games of last year or else you're worried about losing that uh, unprotected pick that's going to go to New York still. Now it's going to go next year, no matter what. Uh, but it was top 10 protected. So it's like you had to tank those last two games, essentially. And on top of that, you had to have the draft odds break in your favor that nobody leaped you with better odds. You held at 10 like you des desperately, desperately needed to. Then of the guys you wanted, you still have one available for you. In fact, you have multiple of them 
three guys really linked to you available draft night. And so you roll the dice and you say, you know what? We need to be more aggressive here. It's not just enough to say, hey, here's one of the guys we want. We need to be more aggressive. So they trade back with OKC to go back from 10 to 12. And in the process, they shed the Davis Bertans contract, which gives them $17 million in uh, trade cap flexibility, which is to say it doesn't create cap space. But now if they want to make a trade, they don't have to make the dollars match up exactly. They can have that deficiency. And so that then allows them to make another trade with Sacramento because Sacramento narrowly misses out on the guy they presumably wanted. And so they make a similar deal to what Dallas did with OKC earlier in the draft. And as a result of that, you bring in Rashawn Holmes and you get Omax. Like it is a phenomenal thing. Like just that alone, the the how precarious that position was, and then how masterfully that Nico navigated it really impressed the hell out of me. But even more than that, the moves since then have all been very good. Even even one that I'll admit I was scratching my head at a little bit, and I'm gonna get into it in just in a minute. Uh, I'm now kind of looking at it as like, you know what? I don't, I actually don't have a problem with this. This feels like a a pretty low risk, high reward scenario here. And so you look at everything that the Mavericks have done, the kind of players they're bringing in, the kind of players they're either moving out or clearing out, not re-signing, trading, whatever. It's been a complete makeover of this roster. This is a team that was 25th in defense, yet they were in the top 10 offensively. And I think they were like seventh after the Luca Kyrie trade. They went from like fifth to seventh. You're going to have that offensive production pretty much no matter what, just by virtue of having Luca and Kyrie. But now, now that you're going to make this kind of investment in your defense and you're going to bring in multiple guys that make a lot, a lot, a lot of sense, you're really opening up, opening up your potential in the in the grand scheme because your defense that was really good two years ago was really bad last year, particularly your your uh, your paint protection. You didn't have rim protection, and now you've got multiple guys with the athleticism, with the uh, ability to run the floor. I know that's not a defensive thing, um, and the ability to at least reasonably protect the paint, including a couple of high-end rim protectors. That's fantastic. All of that transformation is awesome, and this guy, uh, Derek Jones, perfectly fits in that mold, especially for a rotation guy, a guy that's not going to need high minutes. Having someone like him who can guard multiple positions, who's versatile, who is athletic and a great rim runner, a guy who can be at least a moderately reasonable three and D option as well. That is significant. When the coming into this off season, the belief was that Chicago was going to work out some sort of long-term deal with him. So the fact that you got him on a one-year deal, I love that. That that is tremendous value and it shows that a guy like that looks at Dallas and says, there's an opportunity there. It doesn't have the guarantee of years attached to it that Chicago and whatever I'm working out could have, but I bet I could raise my value higher there playing there with premier players and having a more of a role I think there. And I, I love that. I love that pickup. So this is a, I, th I think this is a home run pickup. Now, is that to say that it's going to like blow people away? No, I think it's a smart. So when I say home run, I don't mean like national perception. I mean, this is one of those moves that's a home run in that it is smart. It is very low risk and its potential payout is great. That That's exactly what you want when you're trying to acquire talent, especially at this juncture, right? Over a month into free agency, you're not going to have a lot of like big splash moves that you could make, but you found a position where you still had a need and you addressed it. And it fits, ticks all the boxes for everything you're looking for this off season. You had a clear vision and you're executing it point by point by point in a very smart and effective way. I Love that. But let's get into our next player here. This is someone I talked about a little bit before. I honestly didn't know a lot about him at the time, but I, I felt the need to bring it up. I'm talking about Dante Exum. Now, some of you correctly called me out on that. I was still saying Exum previously when I first talked about this. My first return video, 
I was not familiar with Dante's work, to be honest. Exum's work was a little bit, uh, a little bit outside of my expertise at the time. I didn't know much about him beyond that he was the fifth pick, beyond that he'd been out of the NBA for a couple of years, but gone overseas and kind of raised his value a bit. Now I've done a little bit of a deeper dive on him, and I, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm still cautious, but I'm intrigued. This is another move that I think is a low risk, potentially high reward scenario. You got a guy that's a point guard, shooting guard. Um, He's right-handed, 6'5", 214. He does have a 6'11 wingspan. He does have good speed. There are some full flaws there. We'll get into it. But as I mentioned earlier, he was uh, initially the fifth overall pick by the Jazz. He did have a very shining moment, d up James Harden in the playoffs in, I think, 2016, 17, where you really saw it and you thought, like, ooh, okay, this guy has potential, like, all-defensive team impact it never came out that way and there's a multitude of reasons uh very talented defensively but his offense was ineffective he was not a good three and d guy he basically plateaued after his sophomore year and then injuries just beat him down like a lot of injuries he last played in the nba in 2020 2021 for cleveland he's a career 5.7 points 1.8 rebounds uh Average with 40.7% from the field and 30.5% from three. Not good. Not good. But the main thing with that was kind of those injuries I mentioned. His third season, I think he only played 14 games. And then over the next two seasons after that, he played like 41 total games between those two seasons. So his body was just betraying him. And we're talking shoulder, ankle, hamstring, knee, like it was a plethora of things. It wasn't one temperamental thing. It just felt like a guy who physically could not stay healthy for a multitude of reasons. That mixed with his offensive game seemingly plateauing, not really developing. It really took away from his value. And so he needed needed this fresh scenery. He goes overseas, plays for FC Barcelona, and he, fi- he finds that. He does. He played 70% of all possible games during his two seasons there. And his three-point shooting with uh with Barcelona was greatly increased. I think you take the average of his two seasons and it was like 43 or 44% from 3. The first year it makes it look more drastic cuz it was like 53%, but that was just 60 attempts. So when you account for volume, it's not as significant. Like it's still very nice, but it's not as significant. The following year it was 38% on 201 attempts. So that one looks better and I think it paints a more realistic picture of what you're getting. So if you're splitting the difference in there and you're going to say, hey, you're 42, 43, whatever percent. Okay, I I like that. You've shown now your two biggest weaknesses, availability and three-point shooting. If you've now solved both of those problems, granted, I'll acknowledge, the international three-point line is not as far out. It's not extended as far as the NBA three-point percentage, three-point line. But... I still think you're showing enough improvement in the corner three is the shortest three on the floor. So you're going to have your opportunities there. His position being point guard, shooting guard does create a little bit of a log jam where it's like, all right, well, it's not like you're going to be throwing him in a lot of pick and roll things, uh, scenarios like you would with Luca and Kyrie. If for no other reason, then you're not going to take those opportunities away from those guys. What about his, what about his catch and shoot? Is that something that, is effective here is that something that can be effective for him or is he gonna have no gravity to him and defenders are gonna sag off clog the lane and make it difficult for luca and kyrie to get where they need well this comes from grant Afseth on twitter turns out that the last two seasons exum was highly efficient in catch and shoot attempts uh creating 1.31 points per possession on 117 attempts and when he was left unguarded generated 1.44 1.44 points per possession. That's pretty good. Now, when you're coming to actually guarding him on the perimeter, when it's not just a catch and shoot scenario, there are some remaining weaknesses. For a guy who has good size and versatility, he doesn't really have shiftiness or elusiveness to him. He looks stiff when he's playing on the perimeter, and that sometimes allows even uh, smaller defenders to stick with him. And he he has a hard time enforcing his will in those cases now he is willing 
to use his size on the block against a smaller defender. And he can be reasonably effective there, but that's not really going to be part of Dallas's like MO. You know what I mean? Like that's like a last resort scenario that might present itself every so often. So I'm a little iffy on that, but the main thing with him is his defensive versatility. The fact that he has this length, this general athleticism, he has good speed. It's just, he's not fluid. He's not elusive. And if you're going to use him more in a, a three and D catch and shoot scenario, as opposed to like really orchestrating and running things. Cause again, how many minutes per game do you think you're going to be given to Luca and Kyrie? One of them is going to be running basically pretty much every possession for the most part, or the vast, vast majority of possessions. You're not going to have a whole lot of that here. So it's kind of like Exum is your utility player here. Again, low risk, potentially high reward. Those weaknesses are there. They are real, even with his improvement in his two main deficiencies throughout his brief NBA career. I see reason why he could step in and be at least a serviceable rotation player. This is not the same um, as bringing in, and I totally just lost his name, uh, Luca's former teammate last year. Um, this isn't the same as bringing in his Real Madrid teammate. This is going to be a move that I think actually pans out more because you're going to actually have someone that can be a versatile defender. And again, it addresses the overall theme and checks all of the boxes for what you needed coming into this offseason. Your game plan fits. He fits the bill and he's a low risk, potentially high reward investment. So I like it. Now we're going to get into the last move, and this is the one that's been next to the Kyrie move, re-signing. Uh, definitely the most talked about. I wanted to talk about it early on, but I, I think I ran a poll essentially between talking about this guy and at the time it was Josh Green, I believe. And I still am going to circle back around to Green when the time comes. But for now, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into Grant Williams. Again, a move I mentioned in my initial return video. Now we're going to talk about Grant Williams. This is, I think this is one of the more underrated moves of the offseason at large. And the fact that it ended up being Dallas's maybe third best move, I think is even better. I think it speaks very highly to how good of an offseason Dallas has had. You're talking about a guy who, yes, he might only be 6'6", 236. But he's a, a borderline premier defender. like. He's got, he's got the skins on the wall. He's got the accolades as far as like what he's done on a big stage to show he is a real difference maker. Draft the 22nd overall in the 2019 draft. He's a career 6.2 points, 3.4 boards, 1.2 assist on 45% from the field and 37.9% from three. I like that three point percentage. I like it even more because last year, you saw growth to his game. We'll get to that, though. So we're talking about the versatility of his defense. It can be, I think, at times a little bit, not iffy, but at times I feel like it can be a little lackluster. But when he's dialed in, I feel like he is a borderline premier defender in this league. He's shown the ability to guard at multiple positions. At times he's been, he would be Boston's best option guarding even Giannis, which that alone, the the just freakish impossibility of having to do that and being able to do it pretty well is is huge. Like in that Boston series win against um, Milwaukee, his defense was very, very like, you know, huge and sizable in terms of them being able to pull off that upset. So I do really, really like that. And you're talking about a guy who's been a, key rotational piece uh, for a perennial contender in Boston now. And he's still just 24 years old prior to the off uh, prior to the all-star game last year, he was shooting, I think like 45% from three. He did tail off a little bit as the season wore on. There are some reports that he might've been kind of distracted by his approaching free agency and everything. And you know, that is what it is. But what I like is the evolution of his game that we started to see. You actually saw him starting to put the ball on the floor a little bit and getting to the basket, which he's not purely a just three and D guy, not just purely a defender and then catch and shoot three point look. He's actually starting to develop his game a little bit and getting to the basket, being able to create his own shot. And he even said coming into this offseason, that has been his biggest focus 
is adding that element to his game, the ability to create his own shot. Again, I love that. You're talking about a guy who on the defensive end, he's going to be high effort, gritty, versatile. He's got the ability to lock up guys and to really just make life difficult for them, even if he's not curtailing their production or anything like that. He's at least making them work to such an extent that you're going to, in the long run, be better off for it. You got all that going for you, and you got a guy who still for last season shot, um, I said it earlier, still shot, uh, that was for his career, 39.5% from three last year. So last season ended up averaging 8.1 points, 4.6 boards, 1.7 assists, and almost 40% from beyond the arc. He's also got 61 games of playoff experience, granted only five starts, and obviously uh, finals experience as well. So this is a this is a huge, huge acquisition. And the fact that you were able to do this for, it was a three-team trade, but what you gave up was so, I think, minor in this case. So in this three-team deal with Boston and San Antonio, just to reiterate, Dallas gave up Reggie Bullock, who majority of fans were done with. I I was basically done with it. He had a he had a bad year, and I thought he was going to not be able to recreate what he was, how valuable he was to the team during their Western Conference run the year before. But at the very same time, I felt like he if he had come back this year for Dallas, he was going to be better than he was last year. All the same, you give up Reggie Bullock and a future pick swap with the Spurs. That's in 2030. That's what you gave up. In return, you got Grant Williams in a sign-in trade for 53 million is the total amount for year 53 million. Um, I think that's a good value contract for him. You also got back multiple second round picks, which I actually think is a huge underrated thing. One of this franchise's biggest weaknesses in much of the Mark Cuban era has been their inability to accumulate like draft capital and young talented players. They have built so much through bargain barrel shopping and veterans who have bounced around, or maybe they are a little past their prime or a lot past their prime in some cases. This is actually a great way where you're stocking up, maybe not first round picks, obviously, but you're stocking up at least draft capital that's worth something that can help make certain trades possible. And you're getting back a, like I said, kind of premier defender who can be a starter for you and who can be, and if, and if he's not a starter, he still has the ability to be a significant impact player for you um, doing that. All it costs you is Reggie Bullock and a 2030 pick swap. Yeah, that's a win. Boston in their, in their return just got back multiple picks, uh, multiple second round picks. So it's a win all the way around. It is a win. I love Dallas's blueprint that they have been executing throughout this off season. I think every, really every move has been a really well thought out and designed move. They're not just looking for like, well, of who's out there, what's the best name? Who's the best one out there is going to create the buzz or who's someone who might be a good player, but maybe they don't exactly fit what we do, but we're going to just try to, you know, force a, a square peg into a round hole or something. They're not doing that. It seems like pretty much every move, you know, obviously Kyrie's not a defender. And so you could say like, well, that move didn't, but it's Kyrie. Like the whole point is you're keeping a superstar uh, co-star with Luca. So you've got that. You've got Luca, you've got Kyrie, and basically everything else on the roster is like, yo, unless you're Jaden Hardy, who even Jaden Hardy has flashed real potential um, and even shown like some defensive capability and stuff like that. You're across the board bringing in guys that are versatile defenders. Basically, you know, thinking about this, it's kind of following a similar blueprint to what the Nuggets did, frankly. The Nuggets let some of their rotation guys go who were good at creating shots in recent years. And in return, what they built with was versatile defenders who could knock down threes. It just went heavier on the three and D position flexibility, kind of almost like a positionless basketball sort of Dallas is kind of following a similar bl blueprint to that, which not a bad idea. And obviously with the, what the nuggets just did, you could say like, yeah, if there was a time to do it, this is probably it. So yeah, 
I, I really like the plan that they've had in place and how they've been following through and executing it because this team looks vastly different than last year. I've seen different people talking about the Mavericks like they're going to be some sort of dark horse contender this year. I've seen some people saying that like, oh, Mavericks are going to scare people. I look, I don't know about a dark horse yet. <laughs> I, I feel like Dallas has the pieces that if you give them two or three years, which yes, that would mean convincing either Kyrie to opt into year three or something to that effect. If you have these pieces and you're able to give Lively and Omax a couple of years at least to really grow into their roles, ideally your contention window is while they are still on rookie contracts because it will get very bloated, very complicated, very fast once they're not. I feel like you have something here where it's like the infusion of young talent, having a Jaden Hardy off the bench, having guys like Omax, having guys like Grant Williams, having even, even some of these guys that are further back in the rotation, what they can bring to the table, a Derek Jones, granted he's a one-year deal. We'll see if he's, if he's there at that point, um, having these kind of players that fit the mold, if nothing else, you're giving them potential to really be an exciting team and a team that's at the very least health permitting a viable, very, very capable playoff team, a team that you could certainly see doing something. I always shy away from off season praise. I know it doesn't sound maybe like I've done that here, but it's the fact that it feels like for the first time, they don't just have a plan but they're actually executing it point by point by point. And when you consider how far they've already moved from where they were with two games left in the year last year and basically realizing like, oh, dang, uh, we have to lose both games and hope that the Thunder lose to Memphis in their finale because the Thunder had the tiebreaker against the Mavericks because it was like, dude, we really can't afford not to have our first round pick this year because this draft class is much stronger than what next year's projects to be. You made that adjustment. You made that adjustment. You took the risk. You took the fine, Lord knows. But you were still rolling the dice. You still had to have the lottery odds play in your favor to, at the very least, give you what you expected. And we know from history, even in the case of the year the Mavericks got Luka, they fell back behind the odds. They were the third best odds they ended up with a fifth pick and they had to make a deal with Atlanta in order to get Luca. It worked out there, but here for once the odds at least did what they should. And you got the pick you should have gotten. Nobody leapfrogged you. That's great. Then you're able to pull that deal on draft night where not only do you trade back from 10 to 12, shedding a contract in Davis Bertans, but you're still able to get, Basically, the guy that you might have taken very well could have taken. Granted, uh, there was a guy that was projected in the top five who had slid and was in contention. But you still got probably the guy you wanted at 10 at 12. And you got this trade capital sort of exception, which you then flipped into a separate deal with Sacramento because you were opportunistic and saw that, hey, the guy they wanted just went off the board right before they went up. We could do a deal with them similarly. Shed... You know, we already shed the Bertans contract, but now we can use that, bring in Rashawn Holmes, who's going to help us. He's, that's probably going to be my next video, actually, is talking more about Holmes. But uh, bring in him and his, uh, his productivity, where just two years ago, he was really a viable piece. He's kind of gotten buried a little bit with uh, Sabonis there, but you could really make an improvement there. And then with that pick capital, get Omax. Phenomenal. And then just point by point by point, what they've done this offseason, it's been a mixture of brilliant and it's been a mixture of savvy. And that's what I like to see. Mark Cuban always likes to tell us or at least insinuate that he is the smartest guy in the room. I don't think this is Mark Cuban so much as this is Nico, but at the very least, it's nice to, to have some confidence that your front office is savvy, that they know what they're doing and that they can pivot well, that they can recover well. This is not rallying because all of the top guys are gone. And now you got to convince yourself that Harrison Barnes can be a legitimate number one or 
in the future, number two option for you. Barnes is a nice player, by the way. I would not mind have, having Harrison Barnes back, but that's not even possible. So point being, that wasn't meant to be a shot of Barnes, really. Uh, point being, this is a, a very well thought out off season by Dallas. And I know different trade talks they've had trying to trade Hardaway, getting in uh, Bogdan hasn't panned out, but even still, I really like, or I said, Indiana, uh, Detroit was who Dallas was in talks with. Uh, I really like what Dallas has done. And even though some of the things haven't come to fruition, the fact that that's not just like, all right, we're basically holding Pat really the most unpopular decision they made was bringing back Dwight Powell, which, you know, what can you do? Uh, I guess for what role he brings to the team, as long as his minutes are reduced and he's eventually not going to be, you know, I say, I stress, eventually not going to be your starting center, then I feel better about it. Lively, I think, is the guy. You just got to have kind of those mentor roles and guys that can kind of help him and be a good locker room chemistry uh, asset. And I think you've got all those pieces. So now it's just about nurturing these guys, further developing them, and hopefully staying healthy. But what do you think of the Mavericks offseason? What do you think specifically of these three guys I talked about today? Derek Jones Jr., Grant Williams and uh, Dante Exum. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Like the video, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace! From the prospect to legend.